welcome to the modeling lifestyle, where we celebrate how modelers have embraced their modeling and friendships as a lifestyle. We discuss how modeling can become a life passion and lead to lifelong friendships. The goal of the modeling lifestyle is to preserve the modeling and interests of leading modelers and the modeling industry. The modeling lifestyle is sponsored by NGMC who believes that through bringing hobbyists together with both information and modeling, the hobby will grow stronger with more model builders than ever. NGMC, which started as narrow gauge modeling company, is focused in one quarter inch scale across hobbies. NGMC is a market leader in one quarter inch scale with a range of products from over 50 vendors. In 2021, NGMC became the largest reseller of out-of-production model paint in North America with over 9,000 bottles in stock. And now to Jim Kello, MMR, host of The Modeling Lifestyle. Welcome. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Hope you'll come back and uh, see many more of our shows. Our show introduces you not to just really fantastic modelers, but people who have made modeling a significant part of their lifestyle and, and have made significant contributions to our hobby in addition to their modeling. We thank you so much for the, to the viewers who are joining us on YouTube tonight live. Uh, you feel free, uh, feel free to use the uh, uh, chat function. And as soon as we recognize that you've uh, asked a question, We'll make sure to ask it uh, to our guests this evening. So uh, uh, being live on, on YouTube gives you access to the guests uh, to discuss uh, whatever subjects or try to get clarification on any point that you would care to do. All of our shows are run by volunteers. So if you have a little time, we certainly would appreciate you considering volunteering with us uh, to help produce the show, to help us select the kind of programs that we do to help us with our website. There's a myriad of tasks to be done to get this show going and to keep it running. Uh, and we need a lot of help. So if you can spare a little time, my email is jimkello at newtracksmodeling.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, also, we have a uh, Patreon account uh, because we have some out of pocket expenses. Nobody makes a salary or anything like that from our shows. But we have some out-of-pocket expenses to pay for the uh, Zoom uh, license, to pay for the uh, website license, to uh, be able to get the, uh, the company established in the state of Florida and those kind of expenses. So if you can help us defray some of those costs by a contribution to our Patreon account, New Tracks Modeling, we certainly would appreciate that. We're the only uh, volunteer organization of that, uh, that has a scholarship program uh, for high school graduates that are gonna continue their education in a STEAM program in a college or university or a technical school. Uh, it's all, uh, all the donations for our scholarships are done by the people who watch our shows, read our articles and, and participate in some way in new tracks modeling. Uh, we just finished our first year and we'll be announcing the recipient of our scholarship for this year uh, a little bit later this summer. Uh, our 24-25 uh, scholarship program now is underway uh, and complete information about that program is on our website, newtracksmodeling.com. Uh, and if you can see your way through clear to make a contribution to our scholarship program, we certainly would appreciate that. This is a way for today's modelers to try to benefit the future modelers in our hobby. Uh, and like I say, we're the only volunteer organization that's doing that right now, at least as far as we can find out. Uh, and you know, we don't have a revenue source that we can go to. So the amount of scholarships, the number of scholarships is really dictated by, by your uh, uh, your interest and, and the contributions that you make toward the uh, scholarship fund. So if you think you can help us in that way, we certainly would appreciate it. Tonight, we've got a really special guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. His name is Dennis Brennan. And Dennis is not just a, a special individual. He truly has a modeling lifestyle. 
He's a talented, creative artist. He, uh, he has an art degree from Rutgers. He's a professional photographer, an author, and has made significant contributions to our hobby. He owns his own model manufacturing company. Uh, and he's just an all round real asset to the hobby of model railroading. So Dennis, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Well, thank you for having me, Jim. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited and um, honored to be here. Well, that's fantastic. Well, listen, tell us a little bit about your background. Who is Dennis from? Oh, you really want to know? <laughs> yes, that's why you're here, Dennis. <laughs> well, um, I go way back. With trains, I started when I was four years old. So I've been in the model railroad hobby since then. My dad gave me a Lionel Scout set, and I still have it. And there isn't any amount of money that would ever pry that out of me. And typical story, I grew up, um, trains became a side thing and forgotten about. Always loved the hobby, but just never pursued it. Went to Rutgers, started as a pharmacy major, believe it or not. And um, I, realized, I realized right after that first semester started, I was sitting home doing chemistry problems one night and realized I'm not having any fun. <laughs> so um, I dropped out of school. Didn't tell my parents, just went and played every day. And back then this was the height of Vietnam. So you can imagine what was going on in society. We won't get into that. Dennis, you're coming and going. Your microphone isn't working properly. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, maybe um, talking over here or something like yeah. that. Um, anyway, April came along and I had to admit that I wasn't going to school anymore. And uh, my parents, of course, were disappointed. And so uh, I had already signed up for school the next year and told them I was going back, but I really wasn't. I just signed up to stay out of the draft. But the draft board called me and said, hey, you need to come report to the board. And I went up there and I said, but but you, you can't draft me. I, uh, I, uh, uh, I signed up for next year. Well, you dropped out of school. Yeah, but I signed up. Well, it doesn't matter. You were A1. Um, so um, you need to go for your physical. And I went, but, 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 but I was sick. And they said, do you have a doctor's certificate saying you were sick? And I said, no. And they said, well, you better get one. So I went to the doc, who's a family doctor. And I, doc, you've got to help me. And he goes, are you going back to school next year? Or are you just pulling my leg? And I said, no, no, man. I'm going back to school. Trust me. So I did. And I dropped all of my pharmacy courses. And I had to take the bare minimum to be a full-time major. And so one of those uh, courses was an elective, three credits. And I took the easiest thing that I could think of, art. And I didn't consider myself an artist or anything like that. I just figured, oh, this will be fun. I doodle around and who knows. Well, I realized that I was spending more time doing my art assignments than anything else that summer. I went and took all the courses I needed so that the following year I could become a full-fledged art art major. And the rest is just history. I've been doing, I've been Dennis, doing. Dennis, something's wrong with the microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, um, did you not get any of that? I got it, but it was up and down. Okay, I'll, I'll try to. To keep up, it looks like if I talk down here, it doesn't sound good. Is that correct? No, that's fine. I, I don't know what the problem is. I, all I know is it's coming and going. All right. Well, um, um, maybe uh, my voice is going up and down. And so, no, 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 no. All right. Anyway, um, I became a full fledged art major and um, 
I went to New York to try to get a job when I graduated. I went to CBS, NBC, ABC and said, here I am. And they said, well, what kind of commercial experience do you have, kid? And I said, none. Well, you better go out and get some. And I said, how am I going to get some if you don't hire me? And they said, well, you want to see the list that we have of all these people that are experienced and are looking for work? Unfortunately, you're not one of them. So um, I ended up, long story short, I ended up in a TV station in Duluth, Minnesota. And that's where I actually got my start as a commercial photographer. Um, I was shooting uh, slides and 16 millimeter film back then um, uh, for film commercials and slide commercials. And I realized this is what I want to do. I want to be a director. And so I went from there. Um, I started my own still and motion picture photography studio. I hired a, uh, well, I got in partnership with somebody and we did that successfully for several years. And then I left the partnership and he's still, he's now retired, but he's got it. He had a great business. And I went and worked with a local filmmaker and this is in Duluth, Minnesota. And we ended up getting commercials in Minneapolis. And when we went to Minneapolis, the people in Minneapolis are going, who are these guys from Duluth? Duluth? Guys from Duluth are taking away jobs here? And, um, and then I went from there to a place called Northwest Teleproductions, which sent me to Kansas City. And I was ahead of the studio, um, producing and directing commercials. And I left there after three years. And um, actually, they fired me. Um, because they said that nobody wanted to work with me. Well, two weeks later, I'm doing Walmart commercials. And then they had to hire me back to direct stuff because they didn't have a director on staff. And now they had to hire me and were paying me what as much in one day as they had to pay me for a week's worth of work when I was working for them. <laughs> and so uh, I did that until I was 50 working on my own. And then I, I retired from producing and directing. Uh, and that's another whole story. We won't get into that. But um, uh, I started Brennan's Model Railroading um, in 97, just, just uh, shoot, doing ballast. That's, what, that's how it started. And um, uh, I was working on my layout after we moved here. And uh, I needed something that I could use for ballast and the, the major company that was selling ballast at the time that's still in existence had little tiny bags of stuff that cost a fortune and I needed a lot of it. And plus it wasn't quite the right size for me. So I went down to the local railroad tracks and gar gathered up three buckets of ballast. I just picked it up at random, took it home, dumped them out on my garage floor and sized them out and figured out what the size relationship was and the percentage of sizes in them and looked at the color. And then I went and found something that duplicated that at a local quarry. And um, uh, I was going to um, write an article about that. And I think, uh, well, here, this is a picture of me doing one of my... Um, my other um, ground cover materials, Rock Creek Sand. And um, I dig that up right out of the creek, shovel it in buckets and um, strain it and sift it and bake it. And, and then uh, you get two sizes. You get uh, Rock Creek Sand and then you also get a um, kind of a talus out of it. Uh, so anyway, I... Uh, uh, I was gonna write an article and tell people about what I did. And I think I'll just let Sandy take over from here. Well, before, before Sandy takes over, let me ask you a question. You, you retired, you had a great career. What, what led you to model railroading? Well, 
like I said, when I was a kid, I had trains and I loved, I, you know, I just loved trains from the time I was four. Well, what got me started as a model railroader is, is an interesting story. Uh, third grade, I would go to the movies on Saturday afternoon. And I usually had to take a bus to downtown. I, I grew up in Bloomfield, New Jersey. And um, I would take a bus from my house to Bloomfield Center, which was a few miles away. And um, the bus turned around in Bloomfield Center. And so I would get off. I'd go see a movie. And this one particular Saturday afternoon, I think it was a Jerry Lewis movie. Don't ask me how I remember that. Um, but I came out of the theater and I was walking down to the turnaround spot where the bus would sit for 15 or 20 minutes or a half hour waiting uh, for the return trip. And as I was walking, it was kind of a, I think it was November, sort of, and it was cold and chilly. And I'm walking by a group of old stores and I see this bookstore, dimly lit store, and I walk into it and I figured it was a used bookstore. I thought, I'm looking for comic books, Superman, Batman, whatever. And as I'm looking through the musty piles, it was piled everywhere. Stuff was everywhere. And I saw a stack of magazines. And it said toy trains. I had never seen a toy train magazine, but that was toy trains. And I went, whoa. So I picked one up. And um, I think I paid a nickel for it. And uh, this is it. This is the very first. This is the one. That's the cover that got me going. And you'll see on the right hand side here, it says a box hamper, hamper company. And this is a story by Frank Ellison. Well, I mean to tell you, I read that story. And just the way he wrote, I mean, it, it, just this, the way he started it out. And I'm just going to read just this little bit. It says, every time Smokey Mary pulls a string of freight cars out of the yards, she sets out with the determination of a woman at a bargain sale to deliver each single car in the drag to the particular industry for which it is tagged. Forest Oaks Box and Hamper Factory is one of the industries, and you can wham out this little model in a week of evenings. I read that. And I was mesmerized. And Frank Ellison went on to describe this guy and this building. And all of a sudden, he breathed life into this model and his railroad. And it was that day I became a model railroader. And um, I went back the next week and I bought every issue that I could find. And since then, I've researched everything. I know a lot about Frank Ellison. And today I have the privilege and the honor of producing a series of kits based on the models that he himself built out of cardboard. Only today I'm bringing them alive in three dimensions with you know modern materials and methods. And I think Frank Ellison, I hope Frank Ellison would be proud. Oh, I so, bet he would. I bet he would. All right. So, so now you're a model railroader and you decided, okay, I, I'm going to do a, a model railroad business because I can't really afford, I can't get the supplies that I want for my model railroading on the market. So I'll just make them and sell them myself. Consequently, you started your business. Yep. So now we turn to Sandy. Sandy, we can't hear you. We're not hearing you. Um, there. There you go. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, well, yes, Dennis was about to write an article about the ballast that he had found. And I looked at him and said, why are you going to write an article? Why don't you sell that stuff? I mean, I could see the light bulb go off in his head. And it was like, huh, okay, I could, maybe I could do that. Well, what would I call it? 
And I said, well, you keep telling me this stuff you found is better than anybody, any ballast you've ever worked with before. So why don't you call it Renan's Better Ballast? I just happen to have a bag of it right here. <laughs> we sell it in five pound bags. And so um, he started, well, we didn't, we were, uh, he was out of work, as he mentioned. So we didn't have any money. So we, we had a friend who was a businessman and we said, we borrowed a hundred dollars from him so that we could buy some bags and some, get some paper to make labels and sent out our first bags of ballast. And from there, it all went, it went crazy. And um, we paid him back in about a week and a half. We made over a hundred dollars in a week and a half. We were thinking that was great. And um, so I kicked him in the butt and he, uh, he started selling ballast and then that led to all the other things that we are now involved in, including all the Frank Ellis kits and, and uh, all of that. And um, so when I retired on uh, January 4th of 2019, I went to work with Dennis on January 6th of 2019. <laughs> so I said, where's my trip to Hawaii? <laughs> but, you know, we're doing it and we still like each other and everything. So there you go. Well, Sandy, I, obviously you're the, you're the one that really kicked him and, and got him started in this company. So for anybody that's not aware of it, and we really didn't get a chance to introduce you, Sandy Brennan is Dennis Brennan's lovely wife <laughs> and partner in the company and keeps him on the straight and narrow. Yes, he possibly can. So Sandy, well, we'll, exactly. We'll, Keeping them on the straight and narrow. <laughs> we'll talk more with you very shortly, but thank you so much for that introduction. Okay. So, so Dennis, now you got your company started, thanks to Sandy. And it's, uh, it's starting to take off for you. Uh, you. You started producing not just the ballast products and the other uh, products that you produce, but you started making kits and so forth. So what scales did you work in? I, I mean, you became a model railroader. Uh, what, what scale was all this to be done in? Well, O-Gage basically is where I started. I dabbled a very little bit in HO when I was in high school, but it never went anywhere. I thought I was going to build an HO layout and I bought a few things, but it just it didn't happen. And, um, and it wasn't until I got um, married and Sandy and I had a house and I went down in the basement one day and decided I would start a layout. That was my very first layout. And that was with my Lionel trains that I had from when I was a kid. And um, I've never gotten out of that. Um, but I'm a high railer. And um a high Dennis, railer means what, what, Dennis, what is high rail? I, I, I've heard the definition, but you know, it seems to be different definitions for different people. What on earth is high rail? <laughs> high rail, well, there are a lot of different definitions. If you ask 10 different people uh, what a high rail is, you're going to get 10 different definitions. But I went and um, I researched it. But basically, here's my, uh, my take on it. High rail is once you you go beyond just putting three rail track on a flat tabletop and start doing scenery and start adding buildings and start trying to add some realism to it, you're starting to get into high rail. You ballast your track, you start doing scenery and you're starting to get into high rail. And um, today, basically high rail is taking the way I look at it, it is everything I'm everything that I do is scale, except for my three rail track. Other than that, it's all scale. Maybe the couplers are a little bit bigger and the wheels are a little bit, uh, the flanges are a little big. But other than that, I would put up my modeling against any scale modeling anywhere. So, so that's really, so really the diff only difference between what what you're calling yourself a high railer and a scale O scale model railroader 
is you use three rail track and, and the scale modeler uses two rail track. Exactly, exactly. Because the scenery, it can be exactly identical. The uh, structures, the concept, the uh, purpose of the railroad, the speed building of the baseboard, all of that would be identical, whether it's high rail or scale model railroad. Is that right? Exactly right. I mean, I can operate, you know, I, I would operate trains just like um, um, any two rail um, O scale guy would, dropping off freight cars, picking up freight, using, a, you know, a card system to, to um, um, find your freight loads and that. Um, so yeah, it's the same thing. I just don't have two rail track. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> so. All right. So you tried HO, finally went to Lionel, old gauge. Uh, and this was, this was what, in the fifties? Um, when I went to, uh, well, all through the fifties, I was into, uh, Lionel. Uh, I was born in 49. So okay. all the way through, uh, I guess it was up through eighth grade. I always had a layout every year. Right. Four by eight layout in the, in the, in the one end of my parents' bedroom. So we lived in a small three family house. We lived on the first floor and it was a very small apartment. And so they were good enough to give me enough room to, to play with my trains on a four by eight sheet of plywood that was set on an old table that we had. Got and uh, I did that until I was in eighth grade. And then once high school came along, you know, it's typical story, girls and cars and everything else. And so it all went by the wayside until basically until, uh, until I got married and then decided to pl start playing with trains again. So what, what's your favorite part of model railroading? What do you enjoy the most? Well, I always thought it was gonna be operation and I do like that. I do like dropping off freight cars and picking up freight. But what I came to realize, what I've come to realize is that what I really enjoy is creating the scene, creating the environment. To me, it's, it's, um, it satisfies so many things in my, uh, in my sensibilities. Um, as I said, I'm an artist, and so building is sculpture. I look at, I look at 3D, I look at modeling as, as sculpture, and that's what it is. You're building hills and forms and creating cities and you're looking at shapes and angles and points of view, it's sculpture. And so um, I, I realized that that is what I really enjoy, creating the environment, running the trains through that environment. Yes, I love that, but that's secondary. If I don't have the environment, it's no fun to run the trains. Got it, got it. Yeah, now here's, here's a perfect example right here. Um, now, where do these ideas come from? This, I've had a lot of people look at this photograph and it reminds them of some big city. Well, this is from my imagination. I didn't have a picture, but it's, it's a combination of memories from when I was a kid, uh, the, the kind of row houses, the kind of girder bridge, and the, you know, the, the concrete and the old bus, this is right out of the fifties. And so when I'm modeling, what I'm doing is I'm creating a time sculpture. And this, this particular picture is really um, one of my favorites. You'll notice Denny loves Sandy on the bridge. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, that little bit of graffiti was specifically put there because of Sandy. You know, we're gonna be, we'll almost be married for 50 years pretty soon. And um, uh, it's a tiny detail, but I think it says so much. Um, and uh, if you look at the kind of modeling, this is typical kind of modeling that I do, it's very understated. 
There's nothing in this photograph that jumps out at, at you and says, hey, look at me. What it is, it looks like, and this is what um, I think I've become known to for, is, is taking a picture that doesn't really look staged. Now, obviously, I put everything there. That did not happen by accident. But it has the look of a snapshot. Like the photographer just happened to be in the right place at the right time, put up his camera and bam, he got it. And so that's kind of kind of what I like to do with my photography. And detail wise, not a lot of detail, just enough detail. So hey Dennis. Hey. Yes. So I have to tell you, that is a very to me a very iconic image. So like you, you noted like Ellison's writing style as what, what drew you into the hobby, but that image is primarily responsible why I like play with trains and I try to emulate realism. That was the image. It was a Google search. I was toying with the idea of building a layout and I saw that and that was it. I was hooked. So wow. yeah, it's, it's all your fault. <laughs> it's, it's, but I, I, would, I would disagree. There is a lot of detail on that image. But yeah, I don't think I'll it's understated. I think it's, it's perfect in terms of the detail to make it feel real, but there's so much, the textures, the colors, there is, there's a ton there. There's a ton of technique there. And it, it's deceivingly, it looks, looks so real. So yeah, that was it. That was my Ellison. You're my Ellison. Um, so that's like an homage to you for sure. Wow. Thank you for that, Kevin. Well, I, I, I guess I should restate that. People, I think, a lot of times over detail stuff, they, they overdo it and you don't have to do that. That's just, you know, that's just become something that less is more. There's just enough. You said it, there's enough detail there. Yeah. yeah. But it's not overdone. And no, that's it's, a it's, fine line. Yeah. That, I think that's the art side of to what you, to what you do. And then like you make people like me think I can do that, which is crazy, but. It's, well, you can. Fun. Yes, you can. And well, yeah, other... I have your book and it's dog-eared tab and you saw it. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can. I can testify that a yeah, non-artistic person can try and emulate those type of scenes on their way out. No, I, I appreciate that, Kevin. Thank you. That just, you know, when I get comments like that, it makes my day because that's why I wrote the book. Let me tell anybody who's decide, who's thinking about being an author, you don't make money writing books. Trust me on this. <laughs> I didn't do it for the money. Um, I get a residual twice, twice a year, but it's, you know, if I had to live off it, I would be in the poorhouse right now. Um, but, but I knew when I was doing it, it was a labor of love and I wanted to be able to possibly share and maybe infect people with my enthusiasm about the hobby and about modeling because you can do this even even as an artist okay even as as an artist i didn't just start doing model railroading and do the stuff that i'm doing today i mean i i had i ha i'm blessed because i can see things in my mind i can see it and then i can try to make that reality come to life and that's what I do now. When I was a kid, I would get down and look at that layout real close. And I would imagine my train running through this big city or whatever the scene was. But today, I can bring those images that I had when I was a kid into reality. And that's what I'm doing. And what I'm trying to tell people is they can do that too. You don't have to be an artist. You just have to look at the world around you. And after all, that's what artists do. They look at the world around them and they duplicate it. Now, well, how you do this, Dennis. So like the, your, the images in your, in your book are inspiring, but then your narrative gives you confidence. So yeah, I, I will try. Not that it's prescriptive, but it definitely lays it out. And you feel like, oh, I can do that. So you, and you try and, you know, with that repetitions, you get better. But yeah, so the images like draw you in. And then your narrative and descriptions give you like the false sense of confidence you can actually do that. And then, well, yeah, you know what? Actually, kind of can, which is fun. It's fun. So yeah, I, I appreciate you, man. 
Well, thank you. I appreciate you. You know, one thing, I've, I've read your book too, Dennis, and I've been a scale, O scale modeler. Uh, I'm a trolley modeler for many, many years. One of the first things that, that uh, grabbed me about your book uh, was that, that the way that you have written the book, the photographs that you've included in the book, are just as applicable to a two rail O scaler as they are a high rail. It makes no difference how many rails your track is. You look at the pictures in that book, uh, and, and in most cases, you can't tell whether it's a scale railroad you photographed or a high rail layout you photographed. What you, what you have accomplished, I think, and while it's a book for toy train enthusiasts, and it says so in the title, I think it's just as applicable to any model railroad. I don't think the rails, the number of rails, the height of the rails, I don't think that has any, uh, the size of it. It's just as, what, what you're talking about is just as applicable in my opinion to in scale as it is to O gauge. It makes no difference to scale or how big it is. You can, you can take the kind of, of, of information that you've impar imparted in my opinion and, you, and then convey it and, and use it in whatever scale you're working in. That's, that's, that was my initial reaction when I read your book. Well, that's, uh, thank you, Jim. And that's what I was after. Um, what I tried to do that I can honestly say that up till I did this, I don't think anybody else has ever done what I did. And what I did that's different in my book is I talked about the art behind what I do. I talked about the reason for doing what I do. I mean, if you understand the art behind it, if you understand how I got there, then you can do the same thing. And, and, and that's what I tried to do, to give you the concept. Don't, it's not a, it's not a how-to book on, okay, do this, do this, do this, no. It's I did this and this is how I got to do this. And I even talked about, uh, I think I mentioned in the book how when I did the, the cityscape, I stood there for days before I got that cityscape up there. I stood there for days just looking at it, letting the gears roll around in my head, trying to figure out how to make that work. And then I discovered what to do. Um, and then people ask, well, what comes first, the street or the buildings? And I say, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you, just have to, you just have to start someplace. So telling, showing people the artistic decisions that were made behind what I'm- we both can agree on. It is the model that is the piece of art that the photography enhances. If the model is great, the photography and the, the way the picture is taken and, and uses the modeling, that, that's what to, that is the total piece of art at that point. Yes, and here's, a, here's, a, here's a perfect example. This is my harbor scene, one of my harbor scenes. Um, all of these background buildings, these upper buildings, the farthest buildings back, those are HO. Now, the building that's directly behind the crane, um, that is a warehouse type structure, um, that, is, uh, that is a Plasticville kit bash. I kit bashed a Plasticville airplane hanger into this building. And then the building right behind that, that's sticking up above the crane, that's an O scale building too. That was a kit bash of some Lionel um, electrical substation buildings. And all of the other buildings behind it are HO. And they're right there. I mean, there's hardly any space between those two, but you cannot tell that those are HO buildings at all. You can't tell. And what I discovered that works is the size of the windows. A simple little thing like the window size. If you look at the windows in the background building, right behind that O scale building, which is behind the crane, those windows are a little bit bigger than the windows that are in this O scale building in front of it, or they appear to be a little bigger. 
And the smaller windows, I put back further. And you'll also notice that we kind of stair step up as we go to the left. That's None of that is an accident. That's all part of a sculpture. If you think in terms of shape, and that's what I was thinking in terms of shapes, you've got an interesting skyline. The skyline is punctuated with water tanks, chimneys, and varying roof lines. That says big city. You imagine that there's way more there than you actually see that's actually shown. Hey, Dennis, do you know what's yeah. inconsequential in this image? What? Number of rails. <laughs> if, I'm telling you, if, if the modeling and the structures are that tight, who, who cares about the number of rails? So You're that's, right. that, that's the thing. That, that's the draw to me. It's like, I don't care how many rails. I want my scene to look real. Uh, and, and this is it with technique and um, artistry. They, there you have it. I don't care how many rails I run. I really don't. It's there we go. That's another picture. I love it. Thank you, Jim. I love this picture too. Um, uh, that that picture is another one of my favorites. Um, I actually did this as a. It was a cover. It was a cover for. Um, I think it was um, last December's um, model of uh, classic toy trains. Now, that's not your typical classic toy trains cover. That's a Dennis Brennan classic toy trains cover. Um, uh, they asked me to do a cover specifically and how it came about. Um, how this whole scene developed is, is <laughs> that's also funny. We had a four by eight sheet of plywood on our dining room table, which is right behind me. And um, Sandy didn't want it there anymore. We put that on there and I had made a uh, framework for it because we had a bunch of guests coming over for a holiday, didn't have enough room at the table. So I made a four by eight um, sheet, put it on top of the table and we covered it with um, a tablecloth and that was all well and good. And Sandy said, we don't need that in here anymore. And I was gonna work on this diorama I was going to build this little thing and I thought, well, wait a minute, I'll just take that out in the studio and I'll, you know, I'll build my diorama on there. Well, the diorama turned into this four by eight piece that, um, that I based on a track plan from Frank Ellison, believe it or not. Um, I used the typical track plan that he had going through his little cities which is basically a, a main line um, with a passing siding and then spurs to various industries on both sides of the track. And I wanted to feature my oblong box company, which is the corrugated building that you see in the right there. And um, uh, the idea that I already had the oblong box company as a little diorama on itself. It was a, you know, it was about a, a two by uh, it was probably about a, a two by two foot diorama. And I wanted to incorporate that into this bigger one. And so I explained how you do that, but then I explained how you do all of this. And, um, and when, I told, when I told Classic Toy Trains um, what I was doing, they just asked me for a cover shot. When I told them exactly what I was doing, they said, well, why don't you write an article about it? <laughs> so, so I did. And a um, couple things here without getting overly wordy. Who, me? Well, wait, let, let's move on to another photo here, Jess. All right. What's the next one we have? There we go. There That's is. Totally different. Yep. Totally different feeling from that other shot. Now, this is actually kind of significant in that this is also a cover shot, and it was the very last shot that I took on the Sandy Harbor Railroad before I tore it down. And um, uh, uh, that was also featured in the magazine. I had to explain. Well, 
how I did that. Um, that. That has to be some sad memories of tearing it down. What's the next well, photo? We I, yeah, go for the next one. I, yeah, this is this is exactly what I do. That's what I did to get that shot. Um, you can see in the upper right, I have an Arri 650 watt. That's a, a studio light. It's a Fresnel lens and it shoots a hard beam of light. Um, and then over to the left, I've got a, a, it's a panel light. It's an LED light, uh, same 3,200 degree Kelvin temperature that I'm using to just throw a little light on the buildings, but not much. Um, the key light <laughs> is lighting up the fog because I used a fog machine to get this, obviously. And um, uh, the key light is lighting up the fog and also throwing light onto the train, but uh, it's getting bounced off this white card over on the left. And, um, uh, and then I lit the background separately with a very um, warm colored light. So you can see the difference in the color temperature because That's that was- That to me, Dennis, is a perfect example of excellent modeling and, and the photography just not doing nothing more than enhancing that modeling. Well, thank you. Well, that's what that's, I try to do. It's hard for me to separate the two of them. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's just beautiful work. Okay, now and there's the cover shot. Now, okay. I was disappointed in the cover shot. Um, <laughs> first of all, they added snow. I don't like it. I think they it didn't need that, and what they should have done, but see, I don't have control over it. Once I take the shot, yeah. it's in their hands. But what I wanted them to do was show all those background buildings and get the feeling. You're losing the feeling of the engine coming out of the fog on that bridge in the city. But yeah. they're, they are obsessed with making, sometimes just making the engine the hero of the shot and, and, you know, it lost a lot in the translation, but hey, it is what it is. Yep, it's still a beautiful photo. Well, thank you. So, so Dennis, we've seen a lot of your photography now, but you're a fantastic modeler. Uh, and as you said, you know, you're, you stack up your modeling against any three, any two rail scale modeler out there. But a lot of people haven't ever seen your modeling. They, they don't know it. I mean, it's one thing to say, it's something else to see it. So let's take a look at a few of your models so that people can see exactly what we're talking about. Now, what is this? Okay, well, in that one um, scene that you saw with the crane and the buildings in the background, this is yep. the top part is what you saw sticking up. This is carp machinery. Um, I named it after Roger Carp from Classic Toy Trains. <laughs> and uh, our gears don't whine. Ha. Huh. <laughs> um, it was made, this is actually a pretty cool kit bash, if I do say so myself. <laughs> These are made out of two different kits that Lionel made that were very similar, but a little bit different. They were the same basic molds, but there were some differences. It was a Lionel electrical substation. And I used five different kits to, to put this together. And um, uh, I gave it a, uh, I gave it to, to separate the floors. You see uh, the first level you have, um, I basically used some molding. And from there, um, I went up and I again used molding on the very top. And the key is that that you, it doesn't look kit bashed. And there's yep. a good reason that it doesn't look kit bashed is because I followed standard architectural procedure. A lot of times you'll see old buildings that are divided with a cornice from the first floor to the second floor. Um, and the other thing is um, windows, a lot of times are also in like either pairs or triplets or sometimes even in fours. And so, so we have a bank of four windows and then we have another bank of four windows. Right. And, and so that was the key to making this whole thing work. Um, so anyway, that was a nice kit bash that I was really proud of. Absolutely. 
See another one? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, well, that's not a kit fish, but, but that is that is my modeling. Now the water is obviously the water is the hero here. And um I think all my friends know what I did. Uh but and it's described in my book, but believe it or not, that water is nothing more than shower door glass that I painted on the bottom with uh, Krylon green khaki. It's, it's actually a camo khaki paint, or not khaki, but a camo green um, that I, I uh, sprayed the underside with. And then you lay it down and it acts like a mirror because instead of a mirror is nothing more than a piece of glass with silver underneath. But if you put a color underneath, it still acts like a mirror. Only the difference is it has a green tint to it. But the reason that you see different colors in here is because again, my photography background and my scientific mind as it's such as it is, <laughs> the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So I found the sweet spot with the camera and, and I, what you see reflected here is not only the reflections from the boat and the, the surrounding areas, but the sky. And mm -hmm. so the water takes on the sky color as well. Um, and the modeling, you know, again, those are all HO buildings in the background. And now every one of those HO buildings is a kit bash. I either expanded the footprint or I expanded the height. And depending on, depending on the type of kit, um, that's what led me to do it. And that's also described in my book when I talk about the artistic decisions behind what I do. Um, how do you know how to kit bash a building? Well, go about and go and look at some real buildings. And then come back and look at it. Some buildings lend themselves to being expanded with a footprint. Others lend themselves to be expanded height-wise. And that's just following standard architectural uh, procedures. And if you look at buildings, industrial buildings, you can figure it out. The way to do this, go take pictures and look at what you're doing. Dennis, I want to comment um, on your... When I first read the book, and um, I actually called you later because I, I really didn't see, I didn't really believe that that was going to turn out the way your photograph turned out. I thought you just had done a really good job with the photography using that scientific brain of yours you just alluded to. <laughs> uh, but then I, I later went to Boston, went down to the Harbor area, and I promise you the color there was spot on for the color that you used here or vice versa. So it was really impressive to see that. And when I actually did my um, scene with the way you said to do it, it was like, it really did work. So I, I, that was impressive. It, 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 when I first heard it, first read it, didn't think that was gonna be the case. Well, thank you. And I got, I came up with the color because I, I you know, sometimes people ask me, well, do you, you know, I think Jim has asked me this, as a matter of fact, where do you get your ideas from? Do you yep. look at the prototype, right? Well, yep. when I was building the Sandy Harbor Railroad, I came across two books at a train show, New York Harbor Railroads. These are big hardcover books, New York Railroad, Harbor Railroad, number one, and New York Harbor Railroads, number two. And I snatched those guys up. And I poured over the pages and they had exactly what I was looking for because I grew up in New Jersey. I grew up in that area. I know it, but I needed, I needed to he have some pictures of it. The dock that you see, um, the wooden dock right under the steam engine, that, that came right out of the New York Harbor Railroad book. And then if you look even further behind the, sail the, the tugboat, that came right out of the New York Harbor Railroad book. And if you look to the left of the, 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 the boat, you see the, the pilings in the water. That came right out of the New York Harbor Railroad book. And the color of the water 
came out of that book. If you look down into one of these harbors, it's a murky green. But when you hey, see Dennis, it, yeah. When are you going to make that float bridge kit? Oh, Try out that book. That's going to happen. I mean, I've got drawings already. Um, I'm ready. So, yeah, <laughs> I know. I saw it on your layout. You sent me a thing of your layout, and you've got that. Yes. For anybody who's listening, I am going to make a float bridge, which is where um, uh, boxcars would be loaded onto a barge and traveled across the Hudson River to New Jersey because there, there was no line directly into New York City um, at that time. Uh, you had to go across the harbor. Now, this, this is great that this picture came popped up. This is a scene right inspired by one of the pictures in the New York Harbor Railroad. I don't publish that picture here because it's copyrighted. I did get a chance, I did get permission to put it in my book. And, and so, but I show the picture, that picture, and I show this picture. And the, the similarity is that there is a little tank engine going across a road in an industrial area, and it's really close like this with buildings and there's shadows that go across the street just like this. And that was my inspiration for this picture. And, we and it, there we go. Now, yeah. Now here's another, this is the same scene. Only this, <laughs> this is a different time. This is a different, it's not a different place, but it's a different time. Now, the thing that makes that, that I do with my photography is I try to create a sense of time, okay? And time, not only time in the year past, but time of day, okay? And not only time of day, but particular season. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about creating an atmosphere. We're talking about creating a feeling. Now, everything that you see in this picture, forget the models, but the feeling is totally created with the modeling, with the lighting. And well, the lighting and what I did to change that scene, the snow and the lighting. The lighting is what makes this scene. And it was, it was a little bit tricky because if you see these really uh, nice lights that are pouring out of the store, going across, tickling the street there in the snow, I set that up first. And the reason I set that up first is because I had to then balance everything else so that it wouldn't overpower that light or that light wouldn't be overly bright. So everything had to be balanced to that one little bit, because to me, that's what makes this work. That's that there's two things that really sing to me in this photo. One is that little light that tickles the street like that. And the other is the little tracks in the snow left from the car that just went by. Now, what time of day is it? You, some people might think it's nighttime. I see it as very early morning. I see it as this guy is just going to work on the docks. And he probably just stopped in at Mama Kate's Cafe for a hot cup of joe because she's the only thing that's open at that time. So if you think about a scene in your head and then you try to recreate that scene, that's what breathes life into what you're doing. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Okay, now this? here. Yeah. Now this one, this one, again, the other thing that I want to point out is that I always use, try to use a realistic point of view. Where is the camera when these sh shots are taken? Okay. Now in this particular case, the camera could have been on a porch. Like, obviously you're pretty much even with this universal supply company. You're, you're probably at about the same height as that. So it might be from a third floor porch. There's buildings over there. Or maybe somebody who was in a factory took a picture out an open window. 
and he was trying to take a picture of the train and he captured all of this, but he was really trying to get the train, but you know, he got this. And um, uh, again, the lighting on this, this is, uh, you know, this is one of those kind of uh, sort of overcast, sunny, but you know, overcast, you know, plat there's just that kind of a overcast sky. So you got an overall um, look. And the, the whole idea here is that I didn't want to do anything. That there's a little bit of, 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 of um, direction of light, but I didn't want to overpower anything. I wanted yes, to let that's the your kit. Speak. Universal mm -hmm. Supply is one of your cool plaster kits. Yes, it is. That's the very first kit that I ever, well, that's the very first plaster kit that I ever did. The very first building kit. I yeah, had done I built it. that uh, with no experience just using your directions. And it's, you, you have a flair for writing. You make it easier for a modeler to kind of emulate you. But yeah, well, it's a cool I, kit. I, I thank you for bringing that up because one of my pet peeves is poor directions. A, <laughs> um, uh, I no, made a value. Yeah, a novice, a, novice can, a novice can pick that kit up and actually create it. Now, my painting is not as elegant you know as good as yours but like the the creation the building the fabrication is pretty straightforward with your direction well thank you I, I i try to make it accessible and i try to explain what i do is i try to i act as if you've never done this before and okay, that's, that's a good problem. assumption <laughs> <laughs> well I, I want people that there's two reasons for this i want people to enjoy the uh, the well, I'm going to call it the art of modeling. I want them to enjoy it. If you don't have a good modeling experience, you're not going to want to do it. Yeah, and it's if crazy it's because like, it's just, it's almost intimidating. It sounds bizarre to even say that, but like having never built a model, I was like, oh, I can't do that. So you like, you feel like there's no way possible you can create that. But then, you know, like you read your directions, like, oh, you know what? I actually can do this. But yeah, there was something comforting about reading it the way you write it. To make you believe that you can actually create that. It's a, well, maybe it's an you. illusion, but it works well. Well, I, I thank Dennis, you. <laughs> Dennis, is this where Alex and I need, or, I'm sorry, Kevin and I need to uh, advise everybody that we've been paid to be here? Yeah. I, <laughs> wait, wait, you're getting paid for this? Wait a second. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Kevin, you need to get a better agent, brother. Well, listen, let, let, let's take a break here a minute and, and introduce these people so that we know who they are as, as uh, we see them. So let me introduce first uh, Kevin Garcia. And Kevin, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you met and, and know uh, Dennis. I'll tell you why I am not. I am not an artist. I never fancied myself being an artist. But I, I, um, I had trains when I was a little kid. And my grandpa, who I had trained around the, the Christmas tree. And, you know, the same old story, kind of like Dennis was saying. And uh, got married, and then I thought, you know, I have a basement. Let's build a layout. And I Googled, I just Googled, you know, model railroading, whatever. And then Dennis's book came up, and that that image, I go back to that image. I am not even like, uh, I'm I'm not even being grandiose. I mean, that image with the bus going under that the girder with the Danny Love Sandy that hooked me. That that's all. It's because of that image that I even do what I do. So I, I really, I sincerely mean that. But um, yeah, so I met Dennis. I bought, I ordered the book online. Do you remember this, Dennis? And then it never came to me. So I called him up, I'm like, yo, yo, I ordered the book, never got it. He's, we talked on the phone for 20, 30 minutes. He sent me another one. And then we just became friends, just as a result of just calling him and saying, I ordered the book, never got it. He shipped me a second one. And, and uh, the rest is history. It's, it's been a good friendship, it really has. Cost Absolutely. me a lot of money, Dennis, a lot of money. <laughs> 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 oh this is cool yeah Dennis, this is uh this is dennis another dennis kit plaster kit a roundhouse uh scale roundhouse massive roundhouse well um is that uh, one kit? is that one kit or is that several of the same kits that's well, one kit that's I one kit that. with add-ons oh that's that true yeah Okay. It's one kit with the, the basic kit was a three stall roundhouse and okay. Kevin wanted a seven stall roundhouse. Yes. Why and, not? Yeah, yeah. Why not? <laughs> and Kevin was 
actually, Kevin, I, Kevin and I really bonded over this because, um, uh, Kevin, you can tell them the story if you want. Well, so um, the story goes like this. We, I, he was kicking around the idea of a roundhouse, didn't have the instructions yet, didn't have all the pieces yet. And, and so Dennis lives in Independence. I live in St. Louis. So it's, we're not that far away. So I think I may have mentioned, well, you know, why don't we just build this and I can, um, we can help write the instructions together and, and uh, it'd be like your prototype. So and that's what we did. Keep in mind, I'm a total stranger. So the funny thing, you can tell a story about your daughter. So Dennis is at my house like the <laughs> first night and he gets a call from his daughter. It, it, it's hilarious. <laughs> well, I have to preface the, the daughter story um, with, I went to New York. Some guy wanted me to work on his layout in New York City. And um, uh, he lived with his mom. And he's like, you know, 40 years old. That should have been my first clue. <laughs> <laughs> but I went there. He had, you know, he gave me some money. I had him sign a contract and everything. Um, and basically, I was going to give him a master class on how to ballast this railroad and do scenery and do the stuff that I do. And we were going to spend a week. I was going to spend five days there and about 20 hours because he didn't have a lot of money. So I, I figured, well, we'll work. We'll work. Um, you know, we'll work for four hours a day for five days. And uh, long story short, this guy was a weirdo. I mean, a real weirdo. And my daughter, my daughter was afraid, you know, that <laughs> I was going to end up in chains in a basement somewhere and she'd never see me again. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so um, the first night, the, the, so Dennis came to the house we, and the first night she called him and we were still working. It was late. We had late, many late nights and she called him. And I can hear him saying on the phone, no, I won't end up in a box in a basement. And I'm like thinking, oh, my God, who does she think I am? <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. That, that was, was funny. pretty funny. But so um, the, the cool thing is this, this show is about like friendships and modeling. And yeah, this is I mean, our friendship is completely because of model railroading. And uh, it's just cool. It's cool that I have a friend now that that almost like a mentor in a lot of ways, but also a friend. So it. it there is something to it. This hobby does bring people together. And oh, I'm not a serial killer, so you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Kevin. No, the yeah. feeling definitely mutual. We've and had he came back. He did come back multiple weekends. Multiple, yeah. multiple, right, Sandy? I mean, I took it from you a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's I okay. Think, you can come. <laughs> I think, didn't we figure out that it took us 80 man hours between you and me? To, to to put that roundhouse together yeah that you're yes absolutely yeah. it was insane. a massive yeah it was then a I massive. Moved. yeah then he moved Genius. And you could see how big this sucker is um, i couldn't find the picture with you like with your arms flayed wide and the oh. roundhouse is wider than your wingspan yeah the i looked for it i was trying to find it man i couldn't find it he's got a wingspan yeah. of about 24 inches that's a wingspan <laughs> that's dennis's wingspan <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to leave that one alone. Do we have any more pictures there, Phil? Of Kevin? What? Oh, Phil, Phil, do you have any more pictures to show for Kevin? That's okay. probably the roundhouse build. I don't think we have many more. You're good. That was a good time. Oh, okay. Okay, fine. Well, listen, thank you so much, Kevin. We appreciate it. And, and feel free to chime in. Uh, you're going to be on the screen uh, the whole time from this point on. So thank you so much for your, uh, uh, your, your information. We really appreciate you being here this evening. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, now let's go to Sandy, who is, again, Dennis's wife. Sandy, welcome. Can you well, tell thank us, you. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about who Sandy is and, and uh, uh, you know, how are, how are you uh, how are you staying with this guy for almost 50 years? <laughs> That's yeah, a good question. Yeah, I still like him and everything. That's um, an accomplishment. We met in, in Duluth 
and I was involved in, in uh, uh, community theater. And we were doing a play, a, a musical called The First 50 Years Are the Hardest. And it was just kind of a compilation of, of uh, musicals from 50 years. And I was playing Betty Boop and Shirley Temple. Um, and I, Dennis was doing some photography. He was making a commercial for the play. And so I came out dressed as Betty Boop singing, I want to be loved by you. And he always says, he made me get on a box because I wasn't tall as, as tall as the other people who he was filming that day. And so that was a big joke. I was on the box. Okay, so um, that was in March. We started dating in May and got married in October of that same year. So, and everyone thought we were both absolutely crazy. And I, and I came to realize soon that Dennis was uh, an avid train fan and avid about real trains just about as much as the models. We ride scenic railroads wherever we go. And so um, I just jumped in to, to the whole train thing. I mean, I always loved trains too. I'd never ridden one before I met Dennis, but then we've ridden many. And um, so when he started doing the, the layout, I can help with a few things. Like in the one picture that we saw recently of the cafe, we wanted to put some curtains in the windows and you can't use real fabric because it looks way too big scale. You can't find anything thin enough. So it looks like real curtains. So I thought, why don't we look for a picture of curtains on the internet? We cut them out. I pasted them up and I look at that thing and I think, I cannot believe it. They absolutely look real. So I had a good idea, a good model railroading idea. And so, you know, we bounce ideas back and forth um, about a lot of things about the trains. And uh, so far it's worked out just fine. And I always tell Dennis, since I came to work for him, with him, I, I list myself on Facebook as boss at Brennan's Model Railroading. <laughs> He oh, wouldn't argue I, with that. I will not <laughs> argue with that. Whatever she says. <laughs> yeah. You're a wise man, Dennis. And this, of course, would be my favorite picture from the book as well, because Danny loves Sandy is right there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, 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 that's a picture from York when we're, we set up in front of that banner, which we had made, which is like 10 by 12 or something huge. And uh, that was behind our table. And so that was my first experience being at York and selling ballast and Dennis's book. <laughs> oh, and I'm also in charge of packaging all of the kits. And I'm very particular. My son has asked, well, can I help you with any of it? And I said, no, because I have it down to a science. Dennis doesn't even get to help me. I, I know because we put all the parts in separate bags and we number everything because we want it to be easy for someone to put together when they get it. And so that's my that's my um, my big portion of Brennan's model railroading is kit packaging. <laughs> oh, and then, of course, I wanted to take some pictures of Dennis at the computer while he's working on the, the uh, instructions and working on, you know, making it just, like I said, making it as easy as possible for someone else to come along and just put this thing together. Well, Sandy, it's obviously that you're, you're more than a wife here. You're really, you're, you are the boss. It seems I am the boss. You, uh, you, you play a vital role in, in Dennis's modeling and company and, and we're so happy to have you join us this evening. Well, thank you. Good, glad to be here. No, I have to add something to that, which is um, Sandy constantly challenges me. <laughs> Sometimes I get to a point with a model and I'm not sure what to do. And I, you know, I bounce ideas off her and I'll say, yeah, I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with this. This is, this is not going to be easy. And she'll say, well, if you can't do it, and that's all I got to hear because yeah if you can't do it well you know yeah get someone else to do it no don't don't you know no almost I can do a, it almost a challenge isn't it oh absolutely yeah <laughs> 
All right, so next let's introduce uh, Paul Reeves, who is also one of your friends. Paul, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And can you tell us a little bit about you and how, how you met uh, Dennis? Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I was flattered when Dennis uh, offered a lot of money for me to come on and say some good things about him, and I was really pleased to do it. So, Dennis, uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I got, I, I, I did not grow up with trains. I, I did enjoy a Tootsie toy die cat or a steel vehicle here and there, but I'd always been interested in uh, miniature scenes, you know. I was always just really attracted to where people had, usually it was related to some battle scene or something like that. But anyway, yeah. I got the 1990 February edition of Classic Toy Trains, and it was an article by Steve Bales who had the first high rail layout that I had seen. I didn't have a lot of experience with trains, but I remember looking at his layout, and it was, of course, a three rail layout, but he had uh, scale looking buildings. He had a really neat track plan, had some really good scenes. And I remember thinking, that's what I want to do. And uh, fast forward to the early 2000s, uh, a friend of mine, Jamie Hayslip, was going to help me wire my layout. And uh, he said, do you have any ballast yet? And of course, <laughs> I said, what's that? And he said, well, that's the stuff you put around your track. I said, okay, well, I don't have any of that. And he said, well, you need to call a guy named Dennis Brennan. <laughs> okay. And then um, I remember calling Dennis Brennan and him offering to send me pounds and pounds of <laughs> rock in five pound bags. And I really kind of felt initially like my dad, my dad who, who uh, passed away at, at, when he was 94, had a real simple view of the world. <laughs> and two things he told me he never understood why people buy water and why people buy pine straw. And he just, you know, we used to burn pine straw by the acre just to get it out of the way. But in any event, I get this uh, ballast in. And I, lit I think, Dennis, I think I offered, I think I bought initially 40 pounds. What did it was a huge amount. Uh, a lot. Um, so Jamie helped me put all that down and I thought it really looked good. And then a couple of years later, or at least maybe within a year or two, I went to the York TCA show and there he was, that sweet little thing right there selling ballast like there was no tomorrow. And I walked over and I said, hey, I'm Paul Reeves. And, and he's like, okay. I mean, what? I said, I bought ballast from you. And he said, a lot of people buy ballast from you. <laughs> anyway, it was a, a very unimpressive moment. Uh, but we became friends because we had this knack for we really can make each other laugh over just about anything. So we have been, I've enjoyed the, the friendship that we've developed. And, uh, you know, the, the only thing that Dennis and I disagree on is I do think chicken grit will work. <laughs> I got your chicken grit. I got your chicken grit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I, every time I see somebody posting about using chicken grit, I call <laughs> Dennis and his BP goes up like 190 over 200. You know, it just he's like, oh. So anyway. But he's a super nice guy, really, really knowledgeable. And he's helped me tremendously because uh, I've been trying to develop some kits, and he has been a tremendous help. And you would think that since we, uh, I guess, quote or in competition with the other, you know, we'd be, but he has been really open about how crappy my instructions are and how you know, <laughs> sloppy my structures are. But I really do enjoy it because, you know, when I call him, he's like, Paul, oh, Paul, oh, look. That instruction, you you couldn't get a, an MIT graduate to understand that instruction. Okay? <laughs> anyway, so uh, he has helped me tremendously, and I really appreciate it. And I am sincerely, I'm sincere about that. It's been a big help. And I've got a yes. company called Kershaw Craftsman Kits. We do O scale, uh, O gay, uh, well, 148 scale kits. And um, Dennis truly is one of my biggest fans and is pulling for me to succeed more than anybody else. Well, uh, you deserve to succeed, Paul. And I love this. Tell him about this. All right. Um, I got uh, this kit, of course, from uh, Dennis. And um, this was the uh, packing company. And um, 
I always try to put a little bit of a, a, a local spin on the buildings I get. You can see on the left photograph there, Carolina Pride is a, uh, a meat packing company that produces all kinds of meat products and has been here in, in South Carolina for a, a long time. But the reason that I wanted to get this kit was because I've always struggled. At a lot of concrete buildings in and around where I grew up, a lot of industrial buildings are just plain concrete, but they're, they're not even painted. And I have never been able to get the color right, uh, or at least have an opportunity to try to get the color right. So Dennis sends me this building, I see this concrete. And in essence, what happened with this is I used a, a flat black uh, Krylon uh, spray paint. I did it completely in black. Then over that, I did the Krylon tan color. And um, I'm down the street from the Columbia Fire Department. I think they're going to come by in just a moment. But I, I then oversprayed that with uh, some gray and then some white, all just using rattle cans. And I, I pulled the cans back as far as I could from the, from the surface I was trying to paint to give it just a very light approach. Uh, and, I, I, and so I then used just an India ink wash and it turned out really well. In fact, I, Dennis and I kept talking as we were going through this process because it took a time or two to get the paint right. And Dennis's, uh, the kit was very forgiving because his mortar lines were deep enough that you wouldn't cover those up with another coat of paint. That was really kind of, I don't know that Dennis actually planned that way, but it, the mortar lines took a lot of paint because it, it took some to try to get the colors right. And I love the way it turned out. Um, and I'm also glad that Dennis took out the pictures where the window frame, I, I screwed the window frames up because I put the put them in backwards, I think. Because I'm a really smart guy too, Dennis. I, you know, that hypersensitive brain of mine was an overdrive trying to get your windows to do the right thing. So, but I really, this kit was, uh, gave me an opportunity for the concrete block look and I really enjoyed putting the kit together. And I echo Kevin's comments about the instructions. The reason that I screwed up is because I didn't read them. So anyway, I didn't read them later on. Um, this is from my layout. I had a detached garage, it was a 30 by 40. Um, had a tremendous amount of help for some really cool people, including Dennis. But this is one of the scenes from my layout. Um, this is uh, North Western uh, uh, 280 garden scene. My friend John Drafts and my friend Bo Sis are responsible for that. Um, by the way, it's 104 in South Carolina today. That picture was taken. Dennis took that picture because I told him I wanted that. I wanted it to look hot, and he did. It, those people were sweating. Those 148 <laughs> scale people are sweating like goats right here. <laughs> so these people are not sweating. Um, they're going down a, a river to nowhere, but it looks good in that photograph right there. Dennis took that photograph and um, that uh, the water is just simply some gloss with uh, some uh, titanium white paint. And um, I don't know if Dennis recalls this or not, but we had the people coming toward the photograph and he said, I don't like the way those things look. So we turned them around. They're now going back the other way. <laughs> so, uh, and this is one of my favorite photographs. Um, Dennis again took this photograph. The um, painted part portion of this photograph is Main Street, Columbia, South Carolina, about 1931, state capitals at the very end. Um, uh, Kelly Pelfrey, who is a young lady, I got her card from a consignment store because she did kids' bedrooms and playrooms, sort of that whimsical look. I gave her a pen and ink drawing of Main Street and I took some photographs of some of the buildings that were still standing or still in use. Uh, and Kelly painted that um, on her knees. It took her two days to do it. And then I brought the 3D buildings in. And I tell you what, I don't care how much detail, I don't care how nice I made my layout look. When anybody entered the layout room, the first question was 100% of the time, who did the backdrop? And that it always started with that conversation. And um, Dennis did a really, really good job in capturing my version of Columbia, South Carolina, both in 3D and uh, in the one dimension painting that she did such a great job. Well, I have to, I, I have to add something here, Paul. You really matched the street 
to the background. I mean, she did the background first, and then you added the buildings in front of it. Is that correct? Do I understand that? Yeah. So um, uh, you really did a fabulous job of working with the perspective that she she put in there. And um, as a photographer, when I looked at that scene, this is the only way it could be shot. Now, I violated a, a, a typical rule, um, and I got to talk about this for one second. Um, I never set, I never center anything. That's a rule. You just don't usually center things. They're usually not interesting if you put something right in the center of the picture. But you have to know the rules before you can break the rules. <laughs> and... I broke that rule because this really works. I mean, this that light pole is exactly in the center, but it doesn't detract. What happens is you are so focused and you're drawn right into that little Capitol building, if that's what it is, at the end of the road. So right. marvelous job there. Marvelous job. Well, I appreciate that. The um, MTH, the, the traffic signals were MTH. Uh, some of the buildings on the left side were chooch. Some of the buildings on the right side were scratch built. Um, the actual lamp post in front of you is an HO lamp post that um, seemed to fit well. And I got that idea from Dennis as well, from, from him using the HO structures in the back, because it actually does apply to other things HO. And in case this light, I thought, looked better uh, here, than it would at HO because it seemed, seemed to have been high, but that's not really here nor there, but it worked. And uh, again, I was really pleased with the scene. The painting was tremendous. In fact, she did the entire backdrop. Um, I had given her a white, the, the, the interior of the garage was completely white sheetrock. And I gave her, I just said, look, I, I, I want some clouds. I want a sky, but I don't want it to look whimsical. So uh, my wife and I leave um, to go away for the weekend. We come back and I've got the Sistine Chapel in my garage. She had like <laughs> 40 pictures of sky and she had all these colors blended. And it just, I mean, I knew then that it was going to be something special uh, because of her talents and doing that. She now, I think, lives in Colorado. And at the time she was doing this, she was a, a single mom teaching school or, or or about to teach school. Now, if you get in touch with her, her commissions are about, I don't know, six months out and she's really, really successful as a, as a uh, artist and it couldn't have happened to a nicer person. So I was really pleased to get to work with her. Um, I uh, wanted a scene with a Sinclair gas station because I've always been, I love their colors. I love the dinosaurs. Um, also, uh, I, I wanted a, an urban scene that was, uh, Maybe a not the, you know, maybe a, a real, a kind of a, a real up close look. And so um, Dennis helped me with some of the placement of the people. Um, uh, of course, the buildings were there. Uh, the building on the right is a, a downtown deco. The service station is a downtown deco kit bash. Uh, I think the Model Tech Studios uh, tenant house. And then if you look down, you'll see some guys around a checkered, uh, checker, excuse me, a, a cab. And I just wanted a really kind of an urban scene, blue collar, and it turned out really, really well. Dennis, I think you were at my house for eight hours and you took nine photographs. And that's how intensive he was in making sure the scene was reflected, first of all, the character of the scene was reflected, but also that the lighting was just right and the people were just right. And um, the lady in the yellow kept falling over. We were almost ready to terminate her, but then I said, give her one more time, give her one more chance. We'll put her up there and there's the photograph. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that, that's, um, that's the other thing that I do in my photographs. If I go and photograph your layout, everything that you see on those layouts, well, other than the actual models, but usually all the trains, and the staging is critical. I will move cars. I will move people. I will um, take out something if it's in the way. And I tell you this ahead of time. And if you're going to have a problem with that, then you probably don't want me to photograph your layout. 
So, but I, I, don't well. just, I don't destroy anything. I might pull a tree out, you know, or I might pull out a telephone pole or something like that, that, that really doesn't work with the scene. But, you know, many times after I've staged the scene, the person likes it so much, they just leave it that way. Did you leave it that way, Paul? Everything remained pretty much the same yeah. while I was there. And, and I echo uh, Kevin's comment about the, you know, when you work that closely with someone, um, and I don't know if you call fooling with trains work, but when you're, when you're that intense, and by the way, Dennis, I, I, your work, is, your photo, your photography is work, but you just get, you get to know somebody when you're sitting there and you're working, you're trying to get it right. And anyway, just sharing about the, the hobby and, uh, you know, talking about, you know, our drinking problems and those kind of things. I'm just kidding. We, we didn't have drinking problems, but it was really good. I, I, Dennis uh, is a, is very, very intense, though, in a good way when it comes to his work. But he's never lost his sense of humor. Thank God he's never lost his sense of humor. <laughs> Paul, the, uh, the young lady that did the, the uh, background painting for you, I don't know whether she'd be interested, but if she would... I'd love to have her on one of my Zoom shows to talk about how she did that. And, and you could be on there with her as well as Dennis to talk about how it all blended together and how critical it was for, for her background painting to, uh, to in effect set the whole scene to, and make it come the whole thing come to life. So if she would be interested, I'd love to be able to invite her to come on the show. I, I will certainly reach out. She's probably too successful. She's way, up, way far above... Uh, but what's interesting, though, is when I told her what I wanted, she had no idea yep. about what a model train was. She didn't know anything about backdrops. She had no idea about, you know, blending your colors. And so when I brought her out, I showed her some photographs of some of the magazines. And I remember her thinking, well, I don't know that I can do this. And I said, well, I tell you what, just make it as if it's a scene you're viewing and um, just and I, I left her a couple of train cars to give her a perspective just to so she could take a look. And but that was just her sheer talent as an artist to come in and do that, because this she had never done this kind of painting. She'd always done, you know, whimsical clouds and, you know, she did church nurseries and those kind of cute little things. But I, I when I got back, I was literally I was stunned that it was, it just was magnificent. But I'll, I'll reach out to her. She was very talented. On the other wall that uh, you'll see, I think there might be a photograph of the Atlantic Coastline um, ABA set is actually coming across the opposite wall and she painted the Charleston Peninsula. <laughs> and I thought, you know, uh, she and the Lord have something in common. They can both create something in a day. So she painted the whole Charleston Harbor scene or Charleston, you can see in the background, that, yeah. You can't see it well, but that is the Charleston Peninsula. You can see the Cooper River Bridge to the left, right over the passenger cars. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it was a, a a steel span bridge that's now been replaced, but it was um, again it it it's it was just amazing how it made the scene, yet it is is just sort of an abstract of the Charleston Peninsula. So I tried to cover South Carolina from the coast to the mountains, and she did that. And again, I, she, it, it wasn't related necessarily to her experience with toy trains. It was related to her experience as an artist. And I think that's why Dennis takes good photographs. I know he enjoys trains, got the kits and all that, but I think the intensity of all that is, is what pushes it is he's just a good photographer. Well, and, and I, I'm getting more and more convinced as I talk to people, there is such a thing as an artist eye I don't, I can't explain it to you. I can't tell you even what I'm thinking when I say that. But I'm convinced that the talented artists have a way of seeing things and then remembering those things differently than I do. Not being an artist and not having any background in it. I'm a model railroader. I've got a concept of what I'd like to see created. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I've got the artist eye to be able to do it. And some people, and, and some people, I include Dennis in this, I truly believe have a, a different viewpoint, a different, a different, when they look at something, their eye sees it differently than mine. I was talking to Dennis today and I said, Dennis, there's a difference between 
what I see and what the camera sees. Now, I can't explain to you what that difference is, but there is a difference. And, and I can see that difference when I look at a photo of a scene that I've looked at separately without that photo. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know where this is all going, but the reason I'm so interested in this lady is she has the artist eye, the okay. same as Dennis does. And, and getting people like that to talk to model railroaders, I think can benefit model railroaders in their modeling. And that's why I'm so interested in that aspect of, of, of our hobby right now. Well, it certainly uh, made the layout um, a notch above. I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't want to take credit for that, but the backdrop literally took the layout to a different level. Yeah. Um, and I, I did. I had I had the foresight to curb the corners. In other words, the, the corners of the building were at a 40, I don't know what the angle was, but that all that the, a really super nice backdrop and no corners leaves you with a tremendous amount of um you, you can really work with that and and the horizon goes on. Um, yeah. And I got that idea again from someone else. I don't think I've ever had an original idea in boy trains. I'm pretty sure I have. So, but it was good and, and it helped a lot with the photography. And also, just the, as, as you were standing there uh, face to face, it was a really cool effect. Yeah. So. Well, Dennis, let me change the subject here for you. You started your business. What's the difference in, in building a model for your business? versus just building it for your own personal enjoyment? None. <laughs> let, me, let me explain that. Um, a lot of the stuff that I turned into kits, like my chain link fence kit, and my wooden fence kit, and um, uh, yeah, there, there it is. There's the chain link fence kit. I came up with that um, because there wasn't one and I wanted to make one needed one for the layout. And um, uh, believe it or not, somebody who's been on your program, Mike Tylick, has he not been on the show? I think yes, he, has. he has. Well, Mike Tylick did an article in model railroader uh, uh, on this little diorama, little layout diorama that he built. And, I came across him, I, that was in the 80s, I think. Yep. And I came across that article and I just, and it was O scale. And I went, wow, wow. <laughs> and um, uh, when I saw, when I saw what he did and then he described it, but what he did is he, he built the chain link fence kit and he did it, you know, laid it out. I think he laid it out on graph paper and, and whatnot. When I tried to do it, that was a total disaster. So I came up with an easy way to do it. And um, uh, this particular photo um, became the advertising shot um, for the product. And um, what, what was your question? So I don't get off track here. I forget what you just asked me. What, what's the, when you, when you start a business and you build models for the business, is that different than just building the models for yourself and your own? Not person? really, not really, because I build the models that I want to build for me. And so I figure if I like it, then hopefully somebody else will like it too. Um, so, so, you know, this is the, this is the Frank Ellison kit. This is the first um, uh, Frank Ellison tribute number one, um, which, which, um, I built, uh, and I built it to be used as a uh, for me and for a kit. So all of my models are models that I would, I myself um, want. I don't just build models for the business and then the, it's not something that I would do. These are things that I want and there isn't any, so I make them and then I sell them. What do you what do you think the pros and cons are for a, for a modeler to start a model railroad business? What what? Oh wow! Why should he? Why shouldn't he? Well, you have to be prepared to 
really put everything into it. And by that, I mean, if you're going to do it, I mean, it shouldn't be something, oh, well, I, I just, yeah, you got to take it seriously. I mean, I put, uh, if you're going to do it, you have to be prepared for everything that's involved. Now, an example, I saw somebody who put together, um, they put together a ballast spreader, okay, that, that a car, and they, they took it to York and they had some success with it at York, but they refused to advertise. And then they came out with um, something else. They were going to, they came out with the same thing for HO. And I said to them, well, how are you going to sell that? Well, we've got a website. And I said, yeah, but you, you need to advertise. Oh, well, we can't afford to advertise. It's way too expensive. And I said, okay, well, they're not out. They're out of business now. The thing never went. So the, the point is you have to be prepared to advertise. You have to be prepared to um, create really good instructions, not just some, you know, one through 10. If you're going to do that, you're not going to sell a lot of models. Okay, um, so you need to be prepared for instructions. You need to be prepared to do them right. And that instructions are not cheap to produce. I'm fortunate because I'm a photographer, so I can photographically illustrate these things until the cows come home. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, a lot of people don't have that ability. So they either take really crummy photos that don't help much or you'd have to hire somebody. And that wouldn't be cheap to hire a professional to do the work that I do. That would cost you a lot of money, way more money than you could afford. Um, unless you're going to charge outrageous prices for kits. So you really need to think about, you need to think about a space to do it. You need to think about um, keeping an inventory. You need to think about advertising. You need to think about, um, uh, well, I, I don't even know. I mean, there's so is many it, different is things. It, is it safe to say that if you don't want to treat it as a true business, don't do it? Exactly. Bingo. That's what I'm saying. And you just put it, you just did put it in a really concise way. You really need to think of it about it as a real business, not as something. And you see that we've seen that. I'm sure you're all aware of somebody who comes out. Um, there was one manufacturer who came out with a few different plaster kits. And I actually, I have some of them and they were gone within, within a couple of years. Why? Yeah. Probably because they didn't figure out everything that's involved in, in producing a kit and getting it to market and keeping, keeping it in, in the market. You have to be committed. Well, I know, should we, be committed. <laughs> I, I think you are committed. Uh, you know, we've been talking now, if you can believe this, an hour and 45 minutes. So I'm going to, to try to ask some questions now, Dennis, and, and, uh, Maybe we can get some short answers because we got a lot to go still <laughs> to talk about here. So, all right, yeah, you got to keep me on track, that's Jim, what or I'm, else I'll keep going. I'm going to give that a shot. <laughs> Good luck. All right. So, you wrote a book about model railroading. Why? How did that come about? Why did you write the book? Well, the book actually started with a four part series of articles that I wrote for Classic Toy Trains. Uh, it was a, um, they usually have um, layout articles that um, it's a project layout, they call it. They usually have it done by their own people. And I only know one other person who did a project layout for them that I'm aware of, and that was Dave Frary. And uh, I suggested a project layout for them, and they went for the idea. And Neil Bazugloff was the um, editor of Classic Toy Trains at the time. He gave me my full support. So I did that, but it was only, it's going to be featured in four issues, and it was only like 26 pages. Well, in doing the layout, and you've seen the pictures, um, I had tons of information that wasn't going to get published. 
So um, really, the the series was very condensed. And so I had a thought that I had all this material and I was visiting Combox. So I went over to their book department and I talked to one of their editors and I said, hey, take a look at this. And I showed him the book and I said, what I'd like to do and what I'm proposing is I don't want to, to write a book about how to build this layout. Although based on what I'm gonna tell people, you certainly could build this layout. Rather, what I wanna do is write a book using the layout as a way to explain how I do what I do. And they like that idea. And so bingo, um, the book was born and uh, I was able to, uh, uh, I was able to um, do the kind of stuff that I wanted to do to get all the thoughts out. And um, uh, I'm real happy with it. The only thing that I didn't like is I didn't want to call it uh, realistic modeling for toy trains. I wanted to call it realistic modeling for O-gauge trains, a high rail guide. And they shot me down on that. I didn't really have control over it. Um, but I was trying to tell them this book is not just for toy train people. This is what you said, Jim. This book is for everybody. But again, since it's classic toy trains, they had to keep that in their title. So whatever. Well, it's, I, I really enjoyed reading it. And, and uh, I, frankly, I learned a lot of, of information about it. I had never heard some of the uh, things that you talked about. So in addition to being an artist, and in addition to being an author, you've been officially recognized for your photography and received awards for your photography. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the awards? Sure. Um, well, I, 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 uh, I was um, honored by Classic Toy Trains on their 30th anniversary. Um, throughout the whole year, they were, they were talking about people who helped the magazine get to where it was. And they were talking about the people who actually worked for Kambach. And the last of the articles that they wrote about that, I think it was probably in the December issue, maybe, I don't remember. Um, they honored freelancers, freelance photographers who uh, helped them. And I was one of them, and you can see my name over there in the left hand, upper left hand corner. Um, they featured me uh, for helping them over 30 years. And one of the things that they said was that they compared me or compared Dave Freire and um, um, uh, Fred Dole to me. Uh, not me to them, but them to me as somebody who um, who did some outstanding work and not only um, uh, wrote articles, but um, uh, did out, not only did photography, but wrote articles. And so that was that was a real honor for me and a real feather in my cap. And then I have one more here. Let me put this up. If we can just go here for a second. This here is um, back in, uh, let's see, that was uh, March of 2001. I submitted that chain link fence photo that you saw to Model Railroader. They used to have a photography contest every year. And um, yeah, and I got a hundred dollars and I just wanna read one little thing about what they said. Um, they said this O-scale high rail layout superlative detailing combines many well-integrated elements. And then it talks about the fence and this and that and the other thing. Um, and then it says, um, this photo shows how a great layout is made up of many well-perceived quote, snapshots, end quote from our railroading past and demonstrates that an ordinary away from the action scene on a layout 
can be visually compelling too. And what I've come to discover is that is my style. And I think you guys could agree with that. That's the style that I try to impart with all my photos. I Sometimes there's a hero shot, but really it's kind of like my shots are kind of like the photographer just happened to be in the right place at the right time and took the picture. And that's not easy to do, um, but it kind of comes for me. It's, it's, it's what I do. And I, I really discovered that sometimes you try to search for, you, you kind of wonder what your style is. And, and I come to realize that that's what I do. And um, even in this shot, Okay, just happened to be in the right place in the right, you know, is there a hero in the shot? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a shot. There's a little guy over there. They, you know, anyway, um, that's become my 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 sort of my trademark again here, too. Well, Where's as, the hero? as we've been seeing all evening, I mean, you're, you're so successful with it. I mean, everybody here, I think looks at your photos and, and, and is amazed and envious that, that uh, we can't duplicate what's in your mind and what you see. I, you know, I'm, you know, so I think you've accomplished what you set out to do. Well, thank you, Jim. It's, it's, it's fun. This is another shot um, that I did. Um, I was commissioned by classic toy trains to do a shot on a layout that, that was featured in their magazine and they decided they wanted a cover and um, uh, it needed to be a winter scene. So here's a behind the scenes look. I had my friend whose layout it was, um, uh, Bill Burgess. Bill smoked cigarettes. And so I used that to my advantage. Um, uh, if you, what he's doing is he's blowing, he, he took a drag of the cigarette and then he blew the smoke through the straw to create the steam that comes along the wheels. If you go back to the other shot, um, you can see what he did. The steam yeah. right around the bottom there is what came from his cigarette. And then the, the, the smoke out of the stack is actually smoke out of the stack. And that was an interesting shot. If you go back to the next one again, there you go. Um, the light, uh, I, in fact, this was interesting in this one quickly, my lights, I had been on a shoot for classic toy trains and I was waiting for my lights to come back, but this shot needed to get done, uh, before my lights came back home. And so this light I, I had at home, but I wanted one of my, my studio lights, which were still in transit. And I didn't know when they were going to get there. So I used a simple clamp on reflector, took the roof off the building so that I could shine light. And if you go back to that other shot again, um, you, the light that's in the building that's coming out and lighting the side of the engine and backlighting the fog is done with that scoop. And my um, that panel light that's over in the left-hand side of the shot was providing the other ambient light, blue light in the scene to make it look like um, kind of nighttime and so that's how that came about see and then those windows he had to redo the building to put the lights in it like that um yep. so i had a lot of help from bill who was the the modeler um uh and he did a lot of stuff we changed a few things around he had to create a different background and stuff to make the photo work so well as i've said earlier you you are so well known for your own personal modeling not just your photography, but your modeling. So let's take a look at some of your modeling and, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, the models that you built. Sure. Okay, this is another one of my Frank Ellison kits. Um, this is actually uh, this is the Richmond Packing Company. That's the one that Paul did as a concrete building. Huh. And, and, and I love that. Um, the building, as Ellison described it, was, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Brownstone. And so um, uh, I created a kind of a brownstone um, building look. Uh, and, and as you can see, 
I don't overdo anything. Um, there's a subtle weathering on the roof. There's subtle, subtle weathering on the, the concrete that's holding up the chimneys. Um, then you got a little bit of weathering coming down from the windows. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the corrugated metal on the roof is, is um, you know, very, I think, tastefully done in terms yep. of weathering. Beautiful job. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, this is a um, this is a Corber kit. At one time, Corber was owned by. After the initial person uh, passed, I think it went into his family, and then the family sold it to another gentleman. Um, and he used to go to York, and he revived the kits. But he was looking to make um, different models out of them. He was doing some background buildings, and I suggested, hey. Why don't you let me um, take some of your buildings, kit bash them, and you could use these as uh, you know a basis for a new model using existing your existing uh, molds, but just modifying things. So I made this. This was their electrical uh, powerhouse building, and I kit bashed it and kind of made. Uh, I indented the center section. Those three windows in the center, I pushed back. And um, uh, I added the awning over the, the roof and I added the, the little loading dock and I added the concrete foundation. And then the front, I pushed the door back so that it was, you know, it created a deeper entryway. And I put that little, that little awning type thing over it. And I added the little uh, cornice over the front. And we talked about it. It was gonna be uh, 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 Dennis Brennan signature kits that they were going to do, but it never went anywhere because um, uh, that was a prototype and it didn't go anywhere because uh, whatever he was doing, uh, all the, the windows started melting. They used something on the uh, resin and I'm not sure what it was, but it interfered with the plastic that I used inside to, um, to uh, keep the building together and to, to what I did with the windows. And um, it all started melting and oozing. And he wasn't really sure what it was. I think they finally fixed the problems, but then I never pursued it anymore from that point. Um, but yeah. It's a nice looking building though. Next. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's still it's it still looks pretty good. It was just inside you can see blobs of plaster going. So that will yeah. make it on my layout someday if I ever get back to my layout. <laughs> oh, this is interesting. This is um, uh, I'm gonna. Uh, these are models that I did. This is Plasticville. This is the original Plasticville um, hobo shacks, and I wrote an article. Uh, in classic toy trains on how you could improve upon these. And this is what I did. So uh, I took it and I, I painted just a simple little paint and then doing a few things. Like if you look over the very left of this left-hand building on that left-hand side, you can see a board sticking out. That was kind of molded in to stick out, but I actually freed it. So I, I, I cut I cut it out so that you could actually see that it was sticking out. And then I created the little environment around there and just paint really makes a big difference. The environment makes a big difference. And, um, uh, and, and then here's a couple other little minor things. Look at the little fire and the twigs and the barrel and the couple cinder blocks and the little bench um, and the guy playing the guitar. And then a couple this little corrugated thing here to keep the embankment, the railroad embankment from kind of going down the hill. And you can see how the, how things are spilling around it. That's just minor little details, but adds so much and breathes so much life into the scene. Very nice. Very nice. How about this okay. one? Oh, uh, this one is, uh, is one of my, uh, another favorite shot on the Sandy Harbor. Um, uh, this really shows you um, 
Park machinery, which you've seen before in another view of the Plasticville um, uh, airplane kits that I turned into a, a warehouse. And I had the railroad disappear right into this tunnel, which goes right underneath those buildings. Um, and also the fact that, you know, this looks perfectly normal from this size that a building could be right up against that. But from yep. the other side, um, the building acts as a view block. So you can't really see what I did in the street. The street disappears behind that building. But in this shot, um, that little, what I really like is you see a little bit of chain link fence and you see this little dead end street. Now the street yep. apparently went across the railroad tracks at one time and then they just stopped it. And so um, dad came out in the morning with his kid, parked his pickup truck over there on the left, put his kid up on the shoulders and just waited for the train to come. That's so great. very nice. Very, very nice. Okay, this, this I like too. This is, um, this is really based on my childhood. We had a building across the street from me. It wasn't brick. It was, it was um, yeah, well, there's another shot that shows more what it looked like, but this is a building that, that was inspired by that. And there were three storefronts, two or three storefronts that were associated with that building. And um, uh, the idea was these, these storefronts were together and there were apartments above it. And um, you can see that there's a little help wanted ad. And another little detail that people probably don't ever use anymore is if you look closely, you can see an awning or a rolled up awning. Now people will put their awnings down, but a rolled up awning, and what's the other detail that people never use on their layout? And if you look at this one, this is real close to one on the left, you see the crank for the awning. There's a little metal crank on the very right-hand side going down on the gray on uh, where it says newspapers on, uh, on the most left-hand building. And you'll see that little crank, just a little tiny detail, but I think it adds so much to the scene. And of course, there's a little bit of street schmutz and the streets are not black. The streets are gray and the sidewalks are not, uh, you know, they're not kind of like, Great. I mean, everything sort of blends together. Nothing stands yeah. out. And then we have a guy just standing there looking out over something. And then we have those buildings stair stepping down the street. Beautiful work. Beautiful. Now, this is what I call Jan's Corner. Um, uh, and I'm going to tell a little story here. Uh, Jan was my uh, brother-in-law's mom, and we really had a good relationship. She was like another mom and she passed away. And some people might think this is morbid, but she would love it. He gave me some of her ashes and I put her ashes into this pile that you see right here. And we call it Jan's Corner. And my brother-in-law absolutely loved it. I told him what I was going to do. He thought it was great. Um, some people might think, oh, my God, how could you do that? But I know Jan is up there laughing about it, thinking it's just awesome. So that was the I had a blank space and I needed to do something, but it doesn't really want a building. It needs just something. And so sometimes less is more. And what's what's more than uh, less than a, a pile of debris for no other reason? And then these buildings in the background are all kit bashed. Um, that is a Lionel factory building, um, actually two of them that I stacked up and um, uh, I made into the building that you see. There's really nothing behind them. These are false, basically false front buildings. That's the edge of the layout back there. And I wanted to fill that in. And then this other one here is Durable Doll Corp for a beautiful doll get adorable. And the reason I came out with that is my daughter's name is Dorian. And we call her affectionately, uh, Sandy calls her adorable. 
and I call it durable sometimes. So durable dog court corp was was pretty special. And the only little details are some little fence posts. Now this is across from that dead end street. And you can see that there was a railroad crossing there. You can see just in front of the engine, that's a railroad crossing that was there and was no longer being used. And then we had um, some posts here um, because the street went across, but at one time that street is long gone and there was probably a building here. And so when you're doing modeling, you have to give it a sense of time and place, like I've said, but you have to give that time and place history. And this is the history. The history is something that happened before. It's not just what you're seeing here. How did it get here? What was there before? So if you have some things that hark back to an earlier time, that brings the photo in the presence more atmosphere. Dennis, you know, you just didn't learn all of this overnight. Who were the people who really most influenced or, or helped you the most learn how to be a model railroad? Well, number one, first and foremost, is Frank Ellison. And I've, I, I mentioned that before. I mean, I read everything that he wrote and his stories brought the scenes to life. And um, when I started, when I started doing my own modeling, um, I don't know. I just, it's, it's really hard to explain. Um, but, but before I get off, it was him. Art Curran is responsible for the kit bashing. Uh, Lou Sassy, I think he's written articles, if I'm correct. Hasn't Lou written a bunch of stuff? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I loved what he did. I, I read stuff that he wrote. Um, I, I read every HO book on modeling that I could find because there were no O scale books, really. So I read all the authors. I read Armstrong. I read um, Lynn Westcott. I read um, John Allen. I read everything I could get a hold of. And so uh, I read Dave Freire. And, um, but I, I, I think the, the whole scene thing is just, just trying to relive my childhood memories. That's where it comes from. Like I said, the whole Sandy Harbor, when I got done with it, I realized that that is a time sculpture for me. Those scenes are time sculptures. Those are scenes that I remember from when I was a kid. And not that they were exactly specific to a certain place and time, but they are part of what rolls around in my brain. It's kind of bringing images that I've had from the past into the present and still being able to, to, to like, like, what? okay. When I looked at those, everybody remembers the Lionel magazines and the artwork drawings that they had in those magazines, the Lionel catalogs and the artwork drawings they had in the catalogs. Well, I'd look at those artwork drawings, but what I saw in my mind was something real. I could visualize a real scene. It took me right into it. Well, I didn't, I wasn't able to do it back then, but I can do it today. And it's just bringing a vision in my head to life. Uh, that's about the best way I can explain it. Let me ask you this. When you're build, when you build a model, how do you know when it's finished? Time to stop and move on to something else? That's a great question. Um, question that artists are always faced with. Um, when I was painting, how do you know when a painting is done? Because like painting, uh, modeling, you can overdo it. You can, and I think that's a mistake that some people make. Um, so how do you know when to quit? Well, 
in my case, I'll look at a model and if there isn't anything that's nagging, okay, sometimes I'm working on something and then there's something and it's just not there. It's just not quite right. Sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but something isn't right about it. It's just a feeling that I have. And then I'll look at it and I'll think about it and I'll, I'll ask Sandy for an opinion. And sometimes it's just an inkling of something and and then I'll go to bed and sleep on it. And usually when I wake up in the morning, I'll have an answer. But I know it's done. I think I know it's done um, when I don't have any nagging feeling inside that, hey, there's just something missing. And I, I, I don't know how I, I, everybody has their own acceptability. Now, let me tell you this quick story. Maybe I told it to you on the phone. This is a quick story. I'll try to make it quick. One of my mentors was an artist at the TV station that I worked named Roberta. Roberta was great. I learned a lot from her because uh, I worked in the art department with her. That was also one of my jobs that I didn't talk about. Um, one day I went out to do a commercial and it was a commercial for a play that we were all involved in. And I wanted that old time flickering silent film look. It's gonna be in black and white. It's gonna have speeded up action. And I explained what I was gonna to do to Roberta and she said, wow, that sounds great. So I went out to do it. And the first thing that happened was the, the photographer, I was directing this. So the photographer that I hired didn't wanna shoot it at a higher speed or at a, a slower speed, um, which his camera was capable of doing because he was afraid of it not being exposed correctly. And I thought, okay, whatever. So that was one compromise I made. So now it's not gonna be that speeded up action. Then um, I couldn't figure out how to make it flicker. So I put it together and it was okay. I mean, it looked pretty good. I thought it looked pretty good. And I brought it to Roberta and Roberta said, Denny, she used to call me Denny. Denny, that's not your vision. That's not what you told me about. And I looked at her and I said, but, but, and she said, no, no buts. I'm really disappointed. Well, I was crushed. I mean, she was somebody and she just really, hit me and she said, that's not what you told me you were gonna do and now you're willing to settle for this? I'm really disappointed. And so uh, I thought, oh, I went back upstairs and I started thinking about it and I figured out a way to do everything that I needed to do. Put it on a projector, we had a projector in the film room that had a little screen on it and it was for the news people so that they could look at their stuff. You could play it and it would, and you had control over the speed. So I put it on there and I stuck another camera on it and um, I speeded up the action. And then I took a drill and I put a empty film reel, which has like spokes in it. And I put that between the camera that I was using to shoot this now projected moving image. And I spun the wheel in front between the, that image and the new camera that was taking that image and it created a flicker and I got it done. And I showed it to Bobby and she said, there, there's your vision and you were ready to compromise. And ever since that time, I don't compromise anymore. That's it. I know when it's right, and um, I won't settle for anything less than I know is right. I think that's a fantastic answer. One of the best I've ever heard. Thank you so much. Well, let me ask you this, Dennis, and, and friends. You know, we've been going now for a little bit over an hour, two hours and 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes. So we've got to pretty well close it down but I'd like to give each one of the friends an opportunity to, uh, to say something to Dennis and tell us something maybe that we haven't heard before. And so let me start Kevin with you. 
Hey, no pressure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know that I can add anything more, but I think that the, the concept of this show of having uh, conversations with friends and modeling, and that just epitomizes what Dennis is. If, if you get to know Dennis, he'll be your friend. He will help you. You can call him, he'll give you advice. Um, it's, it's really endearing. I mean, it's, we all love trains. Um, so that's a commonality, but to develop friendships with the, with that commonality, it's pretty cool. So yeah, I just, I'm just grateful for the opportunity, a, a random Google search on a whimsical idea of creating a layout. And I came across Dennis and that stupid image. Good God, that's cost me so much money, Dennis. <laughs> it altered the layout. The, the plan for our home, our second house is a result of a desire to have a layout that could create those scenes. So you cost me a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm so grateful. It, it's 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 a great hobby because you can do you can do things you uh, don't think you can possibly do, and then you meet new friends along the way. So, yeah, no, he epitomizes why people get in the hobby, to enjoy themselves, and make and make friends. And I'm just grateful for the opportunity. So, not really anything new to add, but just a reiteration. Thank you so much for being here, Kevin. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So, Sandy, how about you? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, well, I've learned a lot about railroading, like I said, model rail railroading and real trains. Um, and I have a great respect for Dennis because I know he is the consummate artist. And I know that he is a perfectionist. And I know, and all of this is in the best possible way, he he will keep working on the project until he knows that it's what everyone needs to see so, so that they can understand what the original intent was and what it has grown into. And um, I'm so happy that we have this business. And many people would say you work with each other 24 seven and you still like each other yes I, and I tell Dennis if I was going to run away screaming I would have done it long before this <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's the best he's he's wonderful at what he does and I'm thankful for becoming friends with Paul and with Kevin um, through this project and um, I look forward to doing it until we can't do it anymore well, I'll tell you, Sandy, I think he is one very, very, very lucky man to have found you and to have you all of these years. So thank you so much for being here tonight. You really added a lot to the show. My pleasure. <laughs> well, Paul, how about you? Any final thoughts? Can't hear you. I was remiss earlier about not acknowledging how I know Sandy has been such a huge help to Dennis and they work together better than most people, especially better than most couples. So I give them uh, both kudos for that. She's been a, she's always um, in the background, but what, what a great, what a great support for Dennis. And uh, I've enjoyed getting to know Dennis again. We laugh a lot. We cut up, we, uh, we enjoy each other's conversation and, um, I don't know a nicer guy in this hobby than Dennis Brennan, and it's a pleasure to have been here and um, just enjoy the whole thing. So thanks for having me on. Well, listen, I can't thank you enough for being here tonight. I wish you you're the best of luck in your, your company, your modeling company. Uh, I, I know you're going to make that a huge success uh, and all the best to you. Thank you. So, Mr. Brennan. You now have the last word, sir. You sure you want me to have the last word? <laughs> you got the last word. All right. All I can say is thank you for the opportunity, Jim. Thank you guys um, for your support. Um, you know, I love you guys. I love all you guys, including you, Jim. Um, <laughs> um, and Sandy, Sandy, the reason that everything works with us is because we're best friends. Okay, uh, so um, this hobby is wonderful. I've made a lot of friends. Um, and um, I think this show is, is really a good thing that you're doing, Jim. 
really. Not because you've got me on it. I think it, it, it just, I'm flattered and I'm honored to be part of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the comments. But Dennis, it's been my honor to be with you and your friends this evening. Uh, I've learned a lot. I, re I can't thank you enough for taking the time and, and the amount of effort that you put forward in, in being here this evening. Uh, and again, thank you so much for everything that you've done and are still doing for our hobby. You really are making a very, very special uh, improvement in, in our hobby. Uh, and, and you deserve an awful lot of credit for everything that you've accomplished. No, well, thank you, Jim. You're welcome. So thanks for being with us this evening. Thanks uh, everybody on YouTube for uh, tuning in and, and uh, being with us. We hope you enjoyed the show. We, most importantly, we hope you learned something. You met an awfully, uh, awfully nice man named Dennis Brennan, who is, is, a, is a major asset uh, to our hobby and has made contributions that not many people in this world would be able to, uh, to, to do. So we, we owe him a, a debt of gratitude and, and a lot of thanks for everything that he has accomplished and, and allowed us to accomplish uh, by, by building his kits and using his products in our hobby. Hope you'll come back again. Hope you'll subscribe to uh, our YouTube channel, New Tracks Modeling, uh, so that you'll get notice of all of our future shows. Hope you'll subscribe to our website, newtracksmodeling.com. Uh, so that you'll get notices of all of the uh, shows that we do each uh, Wednesday evening and uh, get the, uh, the Zoom login links uh, each week for each one of those shows. Again, thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. And Dennis, thank you so much again for your appearance. And until next time, happy modeling.